Good morning, everyone. Hi, I'm State Senator Liz Krueger. Welcome. I'm glad you can all be with us today for the fourth of my roundtables on how to make your home age friendly and assess whether your apartment is safe for you. We have a terrific group of presenters with us today, as usual. Um, but I'll first be going over some basics that we always want to make sure everyone knows. One, you, um, I want to highlight that even though it is April 13th, we are still working on the state budget and we will get there. We continue to do what's called extenders, meaning the state continues to function and everybody continues to get paid. Um, but we still have some really big policy issues to work out between the legislature and the governor. Two, I'm sure everybody's been following in the news, these very strange lawsuits in both Texas and Washington state, where Texas now has ruled that the most common drug FDA approved used for early abortions has been challenged whether it can be used or not. And Washington state has actually ruled that it must be used because it's FDA approved or not must, must be available. Texas is, has challenged and said, no, it can't be made available. And so far this morning, we have a temporary restraining order from a group of judges who say it can be used under limited circumstances. So everybody has to stay tuned to continue to see the next part of the civil war story going on in this country over women's rights to make their own decisions over their own bodies. I would like to welcome program attendees who are viewing this event on Zoom and Facebook. Um, we are calling this our fourth session of the 2023 Senior Roundtable, and it will actually be available even after we um, have the live show this morning on both of these out formats. This morning's program will provide information about how to determine if your apartment is age friendly. As always, we have closed captioning for today's event. That means as a viewer, you can activate a closed captioning option to view text on your device. And people with any kind of hearing impairments have found this very valuable. If you're using Zoom, click on the live transcript in the meeting controls to start viewing closed captioning. And if you're on Facebook Live, you will see a setting button in the bottom right hand corner of the video. Click on CC for closed caption to activate the process. This forum is being recorded and everyone who is RSVP'd will receive an email with links to the event video afterwards, as well as the resources that will be posted on the chat within a few days along with the presenter's PowerPoint presentations. So don't think you have to sit there with a pencil and a pad and take very careful notes because all of this is going to be available to you um, within a few days. And now we would like to move to today's event. Again, we've titled it as your apartment age friendly, how to assess your apartment safety. Most of us want to age in place. Many of us realize we should probably make a few changes to our homes, but are uncertain what we can do to make our apartments safer and help prevent falls in the house. Today, we will hear from experts who will provide information about how to make your apartments age friendly, go over your rights um, to have your landlord make these accommodations, like putting in grab bars, and also a fund that may help you pay for these changes. First, we will be hearing from Rosemary Baker, who is the Home Therapeutic Modification Coordinator at Health Advocates for Older People. We'll give you an overview of the key safety issues that impact older adults in their homes. Next, Josh Krasner, the Home Safety and Fall Prevention Coordinator at Health Advocates, will take us on a virtual tour of your apartment, showing you the changes you should consider. After Josh, Ana Martinez, the director of the Equal Access Project at the New York City Commission on Human Rights, will share information about your rights to have changes made in your rental apartment. And then our final speakers will be Madulika Morali, the legal coordinator at the Fair Housing Justice Center, and Craig, what's up? Oh, sorry. Well, let's go. 
the community engagement coordinator at the Justice Center. They will give you information about the Adele Friedman Fund, which was developed to support changes older adults and people with disabilities need in their homes. And many of you have already submitted questions about apartment safety ahead of time. And after the presentation, I'll be moderating a Q&A portion of today's events where hopefully we will not stump our experts and they will be able to give us solid answers. So I would like to start today by first introducing Rosemary Baker and Josh Krasner. Good morning. Good morning. It's uh, really wonderful to be here and I thank you for inviting me. Now I will share my screen so I can formally start this presentation. And I think, Justin, I'm going to have to ask you to bring it up since it's not showing for me at this moment. Yep, give me one moment. Okay. So one of the things I want to give you today is just a quick tour of the house and let you know of some of the important features you want to be looking at so you can age as safely as possible in your own space because we all want to live at home, right? Um, I've been working as a certified interior designer and I've been working as a gerontologist and I want to wear both hats and share with you today what you can do at home. Next. So who are we? Health advocates, just quickly, we're a nonprofit and we have a variety of no cost online and on site classes. We do all kinds of special events and we do home consultations, which I'm going to spend time talking about today. Next. So the New York Times had a great article a few years ago. I love the title. People grow old, houses grow old, both can adapt. So we want to take a look at where you're living, maybe you're a caregiver, maybe you're caring for your parents, and maybe it's just you and your concerns, but how to create that unique fit between you and your unique living space. And we like to look at the present, but we also like to plan out for the future and be very proactive so your home is there for you as your needs change. Next. So I'm gonna talk about real stories, real people today, clients that I have worked with and how sometimes small changes have made a real difference in their lives. So we wanna do a lot of proactive fall prevention. We're gonna look at a few different topics we're going to start with easier mobility because all the research shows that the way falls mainly happen is just walking across a space. Next. Okay, so we definitely want to look at our home environments and make sure we have a good three foot clear walking path throughout the rooms we use. So in this uh, client's assessment, as we were walking through, I noticed she had um, a sense of imbalance with her gait. She had just been diagnosed with Parkinson's. Very simple change here. We just moved the carpet out of the walkway. We moved it over a foot. The good news is that that really helped create a safer space for her to walk in. And sometimes you just get used to living in your own space and don't really see how you can make it safer. Next. I was doing um, an article with AARP and I slipped during the home assessment. They had this very attractive Indian Dory carpet, but no non-skid padding underneath. So take a look at your home when you go back. Do you have adequate non-skip padding? And if you put the padding down five years ago, the, these pads wear out over time. So you may need to replace it, but you need to make sure your home is safe for you, but also your loved ones who come visit and your friends. 
Next. We had a client coming home from rehab and we made a simple change. He was coming home now with a walker. We had the super come up and in 15 minutes, we removed the door sill, door saddle to his bedroom so there could be a nice easy flow with him and his walker. Next. So we started a task force in a NORC, a naturally um, occurring retirement community way uptown. And one of the first things we decided to do was visit tenants who had renovated their bathrooms. So we went around assessing them. And one question we asked was, was there anything you would redo again if you knew now um, what you knew then? And the client on the right said she would have um, enlarged her doorway. She regretted that. She was not using a walker when she renovated. Next. So one a tenant, this is actually a rental apartment. Um, when he was in rehab, we very quickly removed the door to the bathroom. A door takes up about an inch and a half of space. So we were able to get him into the bathroom when he got home. And we put up drapes to add a sense of privacy and insulation. But after a couple of months, when his rehab was very slow, we decided to renovate the apartment. And this was a high-end rental. The landlord paid half. We widened the doorway to 32 inches so we could get his wheelchair through. Next. Um, so we're beginning to take a look at some big renovations and some very simple things. The reason why we need grab bars is because we hold on anyway, don't we? But what we hold on to is towel bars and soap dishes that aren't safe. Next. So there truly is a grab bar for everyone. 20 years ago, there was you know, stainless steel and that was it. Now you can get grab bars in all kinds of shapes and sizes. The one on the left is mine by my bathtub. And I'm showing you the colored grab bars because I had one client who really needed grab bars, but she thought they were very disability looking and didn't want them. Until I showed her the colorful grab bars, she chose fuchsia. She's now getting in and out of her bathtub safely. Next. You can put grab bars or what we call hand holes wherever you need them. This was under a beautiful painting for a client who was diagnosed again with Parkinson's. She could hold on to it as she opened the door, stabilized her gait. Next. For some clients, this client had multiple sclerosis. Um, she was having a very difficult time getting in and out of her bathtub. We got her a sliding, swiveling bench. She no longer had to climb over the tub walls. And we took out her vanity and put in a wall home sink. This enabled her to stay in her home with greater safety and comfort and function. Next. There's also something called a tub cup, which I have done in both condos and in rental apartments. A specialist comes in, they remove a portion of the bathtub, and you really almost overnight convert your tub into a shower. The good news, it can go back on when you're ready to move out. The specialists come back in and solder it on, glaze the tub. You don't even know that it's been done. Next. Okay, just quickly, you want a good chair. Everybody needs a good chair to sit to sit in. This chair was designed by a furniture designer because his mother could not get in and out of any chair that was on the market. So here are the design features, but there's a chair out there for you, but make sure it has these design features. Next. But for Elise, all we needed was to find a cushion, a seat cushion in her apartment. She just needed a couple of inches and she said to me, Rosemary, an aide can make my meal. I'm okay with that. 
I just want to get out of my own chair independently. So Luis just needed a simple modification. Next. Beds. One of the big things I see a lot of is that beds are very high these days. The mattress went from like a lowly nine inches to like an 18 inch mattress. Next, your feet should be touching the ground. So an easy way to, if you have an unsafe bed is to, you can still keep your mattress if it's high, just swap out your box spring and bed frame for a lower model and you can reduce the height by six inches. Next. And my own mom, she was having a hard time getting out of bed. So I installed a bed handle for her that enabled her to get out independently for three more years. Next. Okay, so I'm gonna have to be wrapping it up soon. So I just wanted to say that there's so much you can do to your home with simple color. We know that older adults start getting you know, some visual impairments. And for one client with low vision, he was able to use his shower independently because we got him a colored chair. He needed color contrast. He couldn't see white on white. So look around your house and see, do you need to use this theory of color contrast to help you see better? Next. And my final slide here is very important to have really abundant lighting. But you need to make sure it's glare free, particularly if you have like glaucoma, macular degeneration, some cataracts. Um, this is a Torchair, one of the easiest ways to get abundant lighting. It throws this gorgeous bright light up to the ceiling and it reflects it back into the space. Night lights, I can't. Um, tell you how I value night lights and how I recommend them. I like amber. It doesn't interfere with circadian rhythms. And this one has three light levels. So you have flexibility to customize your own space. I personally like it on low. I travel with it wherever I go. It's a great way to prevent falls, particularly at night. So great to share this bit with you. And now I'm going to hand it over to Josh um, because we are going to do part two of our presentation with Josh, who does the home assessment. So now I'll stop my share. Oh, you're already doing it. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Josh Krasner. I'm the Home Safety Fall Prevention Coordinator, Health Advocates for Older People. Um, thank you, uh, Senator Kruger and uh, Wendy for uh, inviting Rosemary and I, and then for help setting this up, um, I'm going to share my screen here. Um, since being at this position and making home visits throughout New York City, the most prevailing theme among my clients has been resistance to change. We all have resistance to change, but we don't have to let it evolve to the point of crisis. Can you live in your home right now if you were confined to a walker or a wheelchair? Reinventing spaces in your home might be key to living easier, longer, and more efficiently. Pardon me, I don't know why it's... Having a little technical error right now. My apologies. <laughs> there we go. Whether you're living in the city, country, or the suburbs, how we get into our homes makes a world of difference. We need to make our environments as usable as possible. Some alternatives to steps are making a permanent ramp or having a folding one, or installing an outdoor chair, glider, which is a bit of high maintenance, but if you have the time for the upkeep, more power to you. 
But I just did a little research and found out that the average person spends about two years during their lifetime in the bathroom. That gives us a whole lot of time for accidents to occur. So let's make sure it's a safe place to be in. On the left is a client I visited who would grab onto her sink in order to lift herself up from the toilet. If you find yourself doing this as well, stop now. There have been cases where the pressure has ripped the sink off the wall because a lot of us don't know our own strength. A great alternative is the toilet safety frame, which a lot of my clients have had installed. If you don't want a toilet safety frame, we recommend grab bar installations and they wear from 18 inches to 24 inches. Anytime you're sitting and in need of a grab bar, we suggest it being installed diagonally. It is much safer for your back because you don't want to pull it out. On the right, the client was grabbing onto her, toilet, uh, onto her towel rack to lift herself up. They are not designed for that weight. So if you find yourself doing that as well, stop now, get a grab bar. There are indeed though grab bars designed these days that are multi-purposeful, uses toilet paper holders or towel racks. Now onto the tub, in which direction do we install the grab bar? It comes down to personal choice, but health advocates suggest one installed vertically as you enter and the interior one installed horizontally. You also wanna make sure that they're close enough to each other to make getting in and out of the tub a smooth transfer. It is ideal to be able to hold on to both simultaneously. If you're not able to stand while showering, a lot of older adults use shower chairs. Again, if you're getting up from a chair, we suggest installing the grab bar diagonally inside the tub as well. As for the floors in your shower, we suggest smaller tiles. More grout equals less chance of slippage. A non-slip rug for the floor and a non-slip bath mat for the tub or shower. The mat can get a bit grimy, but worth the extra effort to clean because of its sturdiness. So I've met a lot of clients who, while trying to get from one room to the next, stretch out their arms and press their hands against the walls trying to go through the hallways. Instead of a grab bar, we suggest installing a wooden rail. This one we recommended for a client was eight feet long. Walking through your apartment or house, another impediment are the carpets and rugs. They are extremely easy to trip over. If you can't have them completely removed, please make sure there is either non-slip padding or double-sided tape. So here, when the client gets out of bed and steps onto their wooden floor, they abruptly then walk onto the rug. This also is a safety hazard. We recommend to the client to pull the rug completely inward, allowing them to only deal with one surface. All right, so what is wrong with this picture right here? There are loose rugs. There's a cane on the floor, there's loose paper um, with the chair, the two legs of the chair um, are on the rug, which is on even surfaces. And there's a little subtlety between the front rug and the bed, there's a wire in between, which is another tripping hazard. So that that's the idea. We have a basket for all the papers, um, the rugs are removed, the wires removed. Besides physical impediments, there are also cognitive and visual concerns that may need to be addressed. As we all know, memory loss is a huge issue for the older adult population. If you can't store the information internally, you can store it externally with signage. People respond well to letters and color. More than 3 million Americans aged 40 and older are estimated to experience blindness, low vision, and gauge-related eye disease. How can we modify the home for those whose visions have deteriorated? Contrast is a key component. Get their attention with strong, bold color contrast. Not only does this help people with low vision, but it may also add beauty and vitality to a space. Finding tools with large fonts isn't as hard to find anymore. A lot of major outlets 
have uh, caught on to the needs of the ever increasing older adult population. We have a product catalog on our, web, on our website listed under resources that is up to date with a plethora of tools that might be helpful for you. This, the stores we have referenced are Target, Bed Bath & Beyond, Amazon, and Home Depot, which actually has its own department tailor-made for older adults called independent living. Even grab bars might be difficult to locate for some people with visual impairment. These are covers available in different colors, as well as ones with non-slip material. Make sure your rooms feel well lit, not just one lamp. Good lighting should decrease shadows, reflection, and glare, meaning older adults shouldn't have to adjust their eyes or feel discomfort when moving from, moving from one room to the next. There are plenty of different kinds of lights to choose from. Torcheres are wonderful for lighting up the entire room. LED is today's most energy efficient and rapidly developing lighting technology. Night lights are almost essential when natural light isn't coming in from the window. Sometimes older adults don't remember to turn on the lights or feel they don't need them. <clears throat> Excuse me. Removing the need to turn on the lights with motion sensing is a great way to make sure rooms, stairs, and hallways are always bright enough. These lights are wireless, so you won't be restricted to places with a nearby outlet. Some are battery operated and others are rechargeable. And that concludes my virtual tour of an age-friendly living space. Thank you for listening to me today, and I look forward to any questions you may have. Thank you, so sorry. Thank you very much, Josh um, and Rosemary. Appreciate it very much. And now we're gonna hear from Anna Martinez, the director of the Equal Access Project of the New York City Commission on Human Rights, who will provide us information about the right to change, obtain changes to your apartment to improve the safety in your home. Good morning, Anna. Good morning, everybody. Good morning, Senator Kruger. Thank you so much for inviting me um, to be part of this important conversation. Um, so today I'm going to talk about the New York City Commission on Human Rights and um, the rights um, that you all have um, for reasonable accommodations. I'm going to share um, a presentation, so bear with me for one second. Sorry, technical difficulties, sorry about that. Okay, can you all see that now? No, we can't actually. No, okay, let me try again. How about now? <laughs> I'm afraid not. Okay, I'm going to try one last time. Okay, I apologize. Um, I can't seem to get this working. Um, but I will try and talk through uh, my presentation. I'm so sorry. Um, okay, so um, the Commission on Human Rights, we are um, an agency within New York City government and what we do is we enforce the um, human rights law and we educate the public um, on their rights and obligations. 
Um, we have a, a division within the Commission on Human Rights Law Enforcement Bureau that is called the Project Equal Access. Um, and in this division, basically what we do is we um, advocate for um, people with disabilities and seniors to make sure that they are given um, reasonable accommodations within um, their apartment buildings, within housing, public accommodations, and employment. Um, let's define first what it means, um, what disability means, um, under the New York City Human Rights Law. So disability is any physical, medical, mental, or psychological impairment or history or record of impairment. Um, and a person with a disability must be provided with a reasonable accommodation. Um, and what that means, it's accommodating a person's needs to ensure that they have meaningful access to enjoy their housing unit. It could be something um, like Rosemary um, and, and Josh were showing us. It could be structural changes involving architectural modifications, or it actually can involve policy or rule changes as well. The one thing about the reasonable accommodation is it should not cause an undue hardship um, which means the housing provider is the, um, is the one who has to prove um, that they have an un undue hardship in providing the reasonable accommodation. Um, so when we talk about reasonable accommodation, what we do is we, we open up um, a cooperative dialogue. Um, one thing we tell um, tenants is first have a conversation with your landlord, with your housing provider to make sure um, that they even know you need a reasonable accommodation. As we all know, um, disabilities can be visible or they could be invisible. And um, it's always a good idea to first open up this conversation, have a cooperative dialogue with your landlord to make sure um, that they know that you're needing this. Um, and you'll have to tell them um, what you need, um, what accommodation you're going to be needing um, to make um, housing better for you. Um, it's really a good faith dialogue that you have back and forth. Um, and it should be, um, it should be made um, either, we like to say um, the best practice, either in writing, um, in a letter or an email, um, and, um, and, or you can even have the conversation on the phone. Um, but always, like everything else, keep track of the conversation. Um, you ask the landlord for the accommodation and you, you tell them why you need it um, and ask them to get back to you at a certain time. Um, and if you don't hear back from them, that's when Project Equal Access can come in and help you out. If they deny that accommodation, um, then, then they are um, not providing you um, with um, a basic right. So we talk about some of the barriers um, and I'm gonna go through some examples. Um, and it's, uh, there are common barriers that people with uh, disabilities and seniors face in terms of housing. Um, and um, like Rosemary and Josh again, the most complaints that we get here at the New York City Commission on Human Rights are the lack of ramps outside of buildings um, and grab bars in bathrooms um, near the toilets and in bathtubs. Those are the, um, the biggest complaints that we receive here. Um, also, um, no handrails on steps, um, whether it's inside the building, uh, let's say in a stairwell, um, you know, it's a good idea to have railings on both sides to provide someone with more stability. Um, also, um, doorways that are too narrow or too heavy, that's also a barrier. Um, we actually go on site and we can calculate um, the door pressure. Um, how, basically what the what uh, the force is to open the door and there's a measurement and if it's too heavy then we can advocate or you can advocate you can ask the landlord hey 
what about an automatic door opener for that entrance if the door is too heavy? Um, so that's something that we um, we we see a lot of. Um, also stairs that lead to the, let's say the laundry room or um, to the mailboxes. Those um, stairs could become, um, you know, uh, dangerous uh, for someone with a disability or an elderly person. Um, so we try to help and find alternative paths. Um, other common barriers that we've faced um, also are pet policies um, where landlords are prohibiting service animals um, and uh, emotional support animals. Um, also lack of accessible parking spaces as well. Um, if you're lucky enough to live in a building here in New York City where you have um, parking, um, you have to, you know, if you're, you're entitled to have an accessible parking spot, um, and that's something you can ask from your landlord as well. Also, another thing that we hear about is uh, no sign language interpreters um, or uh, no cart services at meetings, at let's say co-op board meetings. So those are the kind of barriers that we see um, people facing. Um, I did have some pictures, of course, um, of some of the work that we've done, um, but I will give you some examples. Like I said, exterior ramps. Um, we have uh, buildings in front of, I'm sorry, steps in front of buildings. Even one or two steps can cause, um, can cause a, a hardship for someone to navigate safely and independently. Someone who say, let's, let's say uses a motorized wheelchair or manual wheelchair or a walker, those two steps are going to um, cause a lot of trouble. So what we do is we go out and we do an assessment and we take a look um, and we follow the Americans with Disabilities Act guidelines, the ADA guidelines, to see if a ramp is feasible and possible um, in front of that building. Um, and if it is, um, then um, we advocate and we negotiate and we talk to the landlord um, to make sure that they put it in. Um, if, if there's space for it, um, and if there is, um, there's a need for it, we are going to ask that landlord to um, to make sure that that accommodation um, is put in for that person. And we've all, we've heard from landlords many times, but I only have one person who's asking for this accommodation. Well, it only takes one person. Um, you know this accommodation such as a ramp can help other people in the building, um, other people who may have a disability that, again, um, someone may not see um, outright. So um, some landlords have given us that excuse, well, um, it's just for one person. It only takes one person and it doesn't matter. Um, you know, if it's feasible and it's possible, we're going to advocate and make sure that that ramp gets put in. Um, also in lobbies, sometimes you have sunken in lobbies with steps uh, leading to the elevator. Um, so we also um, look to see if lobby lifts um, or interior ramps are possible. Um, if you have that situation where you're living in a building where it has steps in the lobby and uh, it makes it difficult to get to the elevator, to the hallway with the elevator, if, if there's space, if it's feasible, we're gonna ask for the landlord to put that in, to put a ramp in or to put a lobby lift in. And then we have examples such as uh, bathroom access. So like Rosemary and Josh, grab bars are a big deal. Um, they help in terms of um, keeping someone um, safe um, and, and um, safe from slipping um, and um, able to um, use the bathroom independently. Um, we've, within, the pro within our project, we've actually, um, advocated for bathroom cutouts, uh, bathtub cutouts, sorry, bathtub cutouts, where um, if someone is not able to enter the bathtub safely, um, we can, um, a reasonable accommodation is something like a cutout 
or if there's space, if it's feasible, if it's possible, we can even advocate for something like a walk-in shower, um, which means um, there's no um, there's no tub. So anyone who wants to use the bathroom, um, let's say staying in a wheelchair or staying in a shower chair, they can do so by just rolling in. Um, those are some of the examples of um, of the cases that we've uh, that we've worked on here. The commission um, we we protect uh, 27 different classes. Um, disability being um, one of the um, highest complaints that we receive here at the commission. Um, and um, if you want to get in touch with the commission or file a complaint, um, the best thing to do um, is to call our info line. Um, and um, I believe um, we're going to have links um, in the chat that will give you that information. But in case, I will um, I'll tell you the info line number is 212-416-2000. One nine seven. Again, um, in the chat, we're going to have some uh, fact sheets for you, some links to our website um, where you could see uh, more examples of what Project Equal Access does. Again, I apologize that my slideshow um, didn't show up on the screen. Um, but I'm hoping that I was able to give you all some great information. Um, and um, I welcome any questions at the end. Thank you so much. So thank you, Anna. And just to show you that we really are a um, team players here at Senator Kruger's office. Senator Kruger has, <clears throat> there was a gas odor in her building. The fire department came. I'm sure it's fine. But I just wanted to make sure. Oh, there she is. I'm very <laughs> glad you're back. Perfect Sorry timing. about that. So sorry. Yes, the fire department's here running around, but they're calling Con Ed and nobody said we had to leave the building. So I'm back. So sorry, everyone. Um, all right, so I just missed that presentation. I apologize, but Wendy, are we moving into the Q&A section? We are going to we are going to be introducing our next speakers. Oh, no, we're introducing Madalika from Legal Coordinator of Fair Housing Justice Center and Craig Walzako. Well, uh, he's going to pronounce it correctly for us, for the Community Engagement Coordinator at the center. Hi, everybody. Yep. Uh, ready for me to take it away, share my screen? Yep, go ahead. All right, hope I have better luck. And it says I am sharing my screen. You all see it? Yep. Great. All right. Uh, hello, everybody. Thank you for that introduction. I am uh, Craig Waletsko. Uh, I am the um, Community Engagement Coordinator here at the Fair Housing Justice Center. Um, I'm going to give you just a quick rundown of who we are, then I'm going to turn it over to my colleague, Madalika, who will talk, you, talk to you about a special fund that we have set up to help people who need reasonable accommodations in their housing to make it more accessible. Um, I want to start by wishing everybody a happy Fair Housing Month. April is Fair Housing Month, uh, celebrating this year 55 years since the signing by President Lyndon Johnson of the Fair Housing Act. Um, I also want to point out um, a lot of times when we talk about accessibility and, and reasonable modifications, uh, landlords and real estate agents sometimes will refer to things as, oh, it's fully ADA compliant. That's okay. It's ADA compliant. Um, the ADA actually refers to public spaces. Uh, when we're talking about modifications and accommodations needed in your housing, whether you own or rent, your housing, uh, those um, protections are covered under the Fair Housing Act, not the ADA. And the requirements are a little bit, I mean, they're very similar, but uh, it gets a little in the weeds with all the legalities about it. But it's an important distinction to make when we're talking about where you live, you know, your bathroom, your grab bars, uh, your light switches, your kitchen appliances, that's covered under the Fair Housing Act, um, which has a little more, I don't know, oomph to it uh, because housing is housing and it's something we all need and we all need to be able to fully use and enjoy our homes. So that being said, we are the Fair, uh, Fair Housing Justice Center. Uh, we have 
advance my slide. Uh, we have a three-part mission. We're a civil rights nonprofit organization uh, started in 2005 uh, with the mission of eliminating housing discrimination, promoting policies and programs that foster open, accessible, and inclusive communities, and strengthening the enforcement of fair housing laws. Uh, our service area includes all five boroughs of the city, uh, also all of Long Island and the five surrounding uh, suburban New York counties, Orange, Putnam, uh, Rockland, Westchester, and Dutchess. Our service area covers about 65% of the New York state population, which overall is around 3% of the entire US population. There are around 100 other fair housing organizations in the country. We have the largest service area, um, and I like to think we have one of the most impressive track records, too, when it comes to fighting housing discrimination. Uh, let's take a quick look at the type of work we do. Um, the, uh, the centerpiece of our organization is our investigative and uh, legal programs. So we do housing discrimination investigations. When people come to us suspecting that they have been discriminated against, uh, we have teams of testers that go out. Um, I like to say the shorthand, we find out what people are being told by landlords, real estate agents, lenders, um, other types of housing providers, what they're being told when they think nobody else is listening, um, which is really the only way to uncover housing discrimination. Uh, ever since the laws were passed back in 1968, um, the, the sort of blatant slammed door in your face type of housing discrimination has been replaced by, we call it the revolving door. It's a smile and a handshake, uh, and people are very politely told that there's nothing available or steered in another direction or just ignored altogether. Um, so those are the types of incidents that, that prompt us to, uh, to investigate when someone comes to us. But we don't wait for complainants to come to us because so much housing discrimination is hidden uh, and goes undetected. We also do proactive investigations to take on systemic housing discrimination. Uh, we do a lot of work in uh, policy and advocacy work. Uh, we do education outreach activities similar to this one. And we provide technical assistance and training for uh, other organizations doing similar work to us. We also have, uh, I think of it as a pretty amazing fund set up uh, for people who are looking to get some modifications made to their housing, um, uh, which falls under, if you are having trouble with that, that, that is disability discrimination, housing discrimination. So I will now turn the microphone over to my colleague, Madalika, uh, but I'm gonna keep running the PowerPoint. So I will not stop my screen share. Madalika, you wanna turn on, I'll turn off my camera. Yes, absolutely. Thanks, Craig. So hi, everyone. I'm Madalika Morali. I'm the legal coordinator at the Fair Housing Justice Center. Just want to thank everyone for being here. And um, big thank you to Senator Kruger and to Wendy for having us today. Okay, so as Craig mentioned, at the Fair Housing Justice Center, we provide assistance to individuals who have experienced or are experiencing housing discrimination. And today I wanted to specifically uplift a resource that Craig just mentioned that we have, and this is our Adele Friedman Housing Accessibility Fund. So we're able to use this fund to provide assistance to people who need reasonable modifications made to their housing in order to safely use and enjoy their home. So you've heard a lot about what these modifications can look like. They can include ramps, grab bars, widening of doorways, flashing doorbells, et cetera, to, to assist people who have mobility or other types of disabilities. So the Adele Friedman Housing Accessibility Fund can be used in two ways. First, we can use the fund to hire an architect who will then inspect your home to assess how different modifications may be made. Second, we can also use the fund to actually finance the installation of modifications in situations where the housing provider is not legally responsible to pay for the modification. So usually this would be in our service areas that are outside of the five boroughs of New York City because under the New York City human rights law, your housing provider is usually responsible for paying for the cost of reasonable modifications. So to qualify for our Adele Friedman Fund, you need to be a person with a disability requesting a reasonable modification. 
you need to have a household income which is at or below 165% of the area median income for your family size, and you need to not be the owner of your home. You can go to the next slide, Craig. So just to illustrate how our intake and fund application process actually works, First, you'll call us or use our online submission form. And at the end of the presentation, that contact information is written. So you'll have an opportunity to look at that. Um, so once you call us or get in touch, one of our intake and outreach specialists will conduct a thorough intake for you to determine what the key issues are and to identify your needs together with you. Once we've determined together that you are requesting a reasonable modification to your home because of a disability-related need, we'll send you that fund application to fill out. Once that's filled out, we'll approve it internally, and then we'll usually proceed with the architect assessment. So the architect will visit your home, they will assess the space, and then they will write a report that will kind of lay out a very specific blueprint for the modifications that would meet your needs. So this report will include, for example, measurements of the space in your home, specific recommendations oftentimes for products that can be used to install the modifications, sometimes measurements of the modifications themselves. So it will be very detailed and very helpful. After that, we will be able to assist you in your dialogue with your landlord management company, other housing provider. And we will usually start by helping you to actually request the modification. So the architect's report really comes in handy here because, because you can make your request very specific and kind of draw on the language and recommendations of the report. We see a lot of complainants be successful in their dialogue with their landlord and actually receive the modifications being requested. But depending on the response, you know, if the landlord denies or fails to grant it for weeks and weeks, we may then, with your consent, refer you to one of our cooperating attorneys for further action. So in the event that, um, and Craig, you can go to the next slide, sorry. So in the event that your landlord doesn't grant you the reasonable modification, and you are referred to an attorney for action, some possible remedies that are available to you are monetary compensation, non-monetary relief, like getting your landlord to adopt a formal reasonable accommodation or anti-discrimination policy, and obviously to ultimately actually receive the modification that you need. In some circumstances, it may be appropriate to file a complaint with the New York City Commission on Human Rights or the New York State Division on Human Rights, and the intake file that we create for you through our process will be very helpful in the administrative complaint process. Okay, so to learn more about the fund and about any of the other work that we do to talk to us about any disability-related needs in your home or to report any kind of housing discrimination, please call us at 212-400-8219 or visit our website at fairhousingjustice.org where you can also access an online submission form. Thank you all, and please feel free to be in touch and to ask any questions. And I just want to add uh, this slide showing the example of what you'll see on our website. Um, possibly by the time you click up, we are in the process of updating our website. It's going to be gorgeous. It's going to look different than this, but it will still be very clear where you click on to report housing discrimination. Thank you both so much. Well, thank you to all of our presenters. Um, I know there's so much good information and I know that one of the people typed in, they're having trouble cutting and pasting from the chat. No worry. We are, as long as we have your email, we will be sending out all the information that has been presented today, along with all of the resources that have been put in the chat today. So you will be getting all of that. And I also can never seem to cut and paste from chat to something else. So I think it's just a flaw with the system. I'm for, with that, I'm going to start the Q&A section. I'm going to remind everybody again that if you have very specific legal questions about your situation um, or actually specifically for people who are both aged and disabled um, i'm referring them to call the new york lawyers for the public interest whose phone number and contact information has been put in chat i think up near the top um, so that is an additional resource for you 
and we have far more questions than we have time. That's pretty much always the story um, with our events because people not only send in great questions in advance, but then as they're hearing the presenters, they are seeing more questions that they really want to ask. So I will start with the questions we had in advance and hopefully we will get through a decent percentage of the very many questions that have been submitted. Um, so just to go over some of, I think, some of the more basic questions that I, I think we heard answers to, but you're never quite sure. So are landlords required to put in safety handles um, in the shower and other locations that the senior has determined need to be installed? And everybody, I guess, who was our our panelists, if you wouldn't mind putting on your pictures and your um, take yourself off mute so that you can jump in with answers. Who would like to take that one? So I think I can answer. Great. I think I can answer that one. So the landlord is required um, to put in um, grab bars um, in the bathroom area. Um, you can ask for it, again, as a reasonable accommodation. Um, you'll need to make the request for that. If they say no, you can contact the commission because then um, we can investigate um, and we can go in and determine whether grab bars number one are feasible and then um, the best place to put them, um, et cetera. And I have a comment to that. We were working with the social worker who was told when she was advocating for grab bars for her client, her tenant, um, she was told she had to have a doctor's prescription for grab bars. Is that a legal requirement, the prescription? Um, it is not a legal requirement. Um, they are not, um, landlords are not allowed to ask for any type of um, documentation, I'm sorry, uh, diagnosis um, about the disability. Um, they can write a letter of recommendation um, saying that they need the grab bars and why they need them. They don't need to specify what their disability is. That's always very helpful. Thank you. I, I found it egregious that the owner was asking for a disability diagnosis and it seemed against HIPAA and every law out there. So thank you. You're welcome. And sticking with grab bars, um, if I'm a rent stabilized tenant, or I guess any kind of tenant, it would apply. Do I have to get permission to have a grab bar installed if it's going to potentially damage the ceramic tiles on the wall? So could I be hit with some kind of penalty and accused of damaging my my uh, bathroom if I go ahead and put the grab bars in or have somebody put them in and it involves drilling holes with screws to hold the bar in place. See, I'll try and answer that one again. Okay. <laughs> um, so um, the, the what we advise um, tenants to do is to, again, have this cooperative dialogue with their um, housing provider um, to let them know what their needs are. Um, uh, let's say, I know this specific question was about rent stabilized apartment, but again, it's always a good idea to make sure that you're having this conversation. Um, the landlord is required to pay for it if it's feasible and possible. Um, if you are um, an owner or shareholder in a co-op or a condo, again, have that conversation with the board. Um, because I know that there are rules um, that each um, co-op or condo association has in terms of uh, renovations and constructions. So it's always a good idea to have that cooperative dialogue, open that conversation up first. Okay. And where well, the bathroom issues are the big deal issues. Um, so I think Rosemary showed how you can actually turn a bathtub into a shower um, relatively easily. Um, 
So the question is, does the landlord have to do this for me? Um, or can they stop me from doing this myself if they're not, if they don't have to do this for me? Me again? <laughs> I guess so. Thank you. <laughs> no problem. Again, the landlord um, is required um, to make modifications if they're feasible and possible. Um, you know, there may be um, there may be architectural construction um, challenges or barriers that um, that let's say myself or my colleague are not aware of that make it um, unfeasible or impossible to do that. Um, but it is on the landlord to provide. Um, documentation or proof that they've done their due diligence to figure that out first. Thank you. I actually no, was very impressed with seeing that um, slide from Rosemary. I had no idea you could just have somebody come and cut a part of your bathtub opening open and then suddenly it becomes a walk-in shower. I wish I knew that for my own parents a few years ago. Okay, let's see. Is the landlord of a rent stabilized apartment required, and I'm not sure the rules are different between rent stabilized or other, so view it as both questions. For rent stabilized or a regular market rate apartment, is the landlord required to give a handicapped person a wheelchair accessible apartment? I don't think so. Anybody have an idea there? Um, I'll try and answer this. Um, anyone else, please feel free to jump in. Um, and um, my understanding is that there's not a distinction between rent stabilized tenants and tenants of market rate apartments when thinking about reasonable modifications and other fair housing issues um, that pertain to someone's living situation in their home. So this answer should apply the same to rent stabilized tenants and market rate tenants. Um, and the legal obligation really is that the landlord engages in a cooperative dialogue with you about your disability related needs. So if you are a person who uses a wheelchair and the way to meet your needs is to be moved to a different apartment that is more constructed and set up to meet your needs, that's something you would request to the landlord and the landlord is obligated to participate in that dialogue and figure out how best to meet your needs. So it could be that a transfer to a wheelchair accessible apartment is what makes the most sense for you. It could be that modifying your apartment doorways or other you know, physical spaces in the apartment might also meet those needs. Um, but the landlord is obligated to engage in that dialogue to finance the cost of any reasonable modifications within the five boroughs. And this is true whether or not you lived in a rent stabilized apartment or a market rate apartment. And again, before I lead into the next question, I'll just highlight if for any reason in negotiations with the landlord, they are actually willing to move you to a different apartment. For example, another question was, can I get help to be moved from a third floor, I'm assuming walk up to a first floor apartment? And we get requests like that all the time. Maybe the landlord will be willing to negotiate with you for that. But if you have rent regulated or rent controlled apartment, you must not do anything without a good lawyer making sure you're not giving up your rights and protections under rent stabilization laws because you do not want to get an agreement to move you to an apartment you think is more appropriate for your needs and then realize afterwards now you've given up your rights um, and your rent amount as a stabilized or rent controlled tenant. So you want to be really careful that you're thinking through both parts of that assignment for yourself um, before you actually do complete some kind of negotiation to move to a different unit in the same building or owned by the same landlord in some other building that they own. Um, so I just want to emphasize sometimes what sounds like a good deal might be a surprise nightmare for you. So you have to be very, very careful. Um, someone talking about they can't reach their cabinets or their pull change 
full change for overhead lights. They believe they need a small dishwasher due to arthritis, but the management says that these would be considered individual apartment improvements and translate into a monthly rent increase. So this is really a rent regulation question um, about when they can or cannot do what's called an IAI. And I don't know if any of our guests are rent regulation experts. Just checking, because if not, I'm going to suggest to my staff that we have Sarah or Audrey follow up with the person who asked that question, because I do have staff who work on these issues, but they're not on the Zoom with us today. So if no one else wants to take a stab at that, I'll suggest we do follow up or with the NILAG phone number that's online um, on chat, because they also do a lot of work in this territory. Okay. All right. How do you deal with paying for changes? Um, so we already heard about the fund that can be access through our last speakers. Are there other sources of funds besides that for home modifications, as far as anybody knows? Um, the Met Council on Jewish Poverty has a department called um, Senior Repair, um, and you can apply. I think if an individual, their annual income is 25,000 or less, or a couple is 35,000 or less, um, I can type in the link in the chat, metcouncilonhousing.org. Thank you. That's what, um, for health advocates, we, we partner with them, with our clients. Great. They provide and install grab bars. They'll do minor plumbing, minor home repair. They'll swap out light bulbs. They'll install a thing, a few things for you. And on their website, it lists exactly what they do, but they've been indispensable for us doing our work in New York City. And I know that the next question involving the possibility of any kind of tax deductibility, if you're investing in uh, modifications in your home, I know the state has some tax deductions for modifications to your home if you own it, but I'm actually not sure whether there's any tax deductibility for renters. Does anyone know? See, I, I, I didn't expect you to have to know. That's sort of more, more, more my office's territory. So again, whoever asked that, if you follow up, we can look and see whether there is any tax deductibility for home modifications to allow it to be more accommodating to your needs and whether there's a possibility of state tax deductions. But I'm, my gut is it was specifically for homeowners. Um, and I think probably 95% of the people listening in today are renters based on my district and all of New York City. Um, another question, how can low income individuals find affordable ways to modify their homes, apartments to be more age friendly, especially if they are renting? Well, I think that's pretty much what everybody was talking about today, um, all the different possibilities. So I don't know if anybody sort of thinks that that question triggers one more thing they haven't already shared with us. Okay, then I just ask. I'll that. just, yes. Sorry, please. Senator Gray. I'll just briefly reiterate that if the modification you're seeking is a reasonable modification that's tied to a disability related need, your landlord is responsible for financing the cost of a reasonable modification. So that's important to keep in mind. And when engaging in that cooperative dialogue with the landlord, you shouldn't be afraid to, to, to expect and request that as well. Okay. Okay. I also um, want to say that there are many different ways to make a home more accessible. As I showed you, sometimes you can just take a door off um, if it's maybe for a year or two to make a home um, or a doorway easier to get through. So just don't think there's one way to do something. For example, um, 
Senator Kruger, you just mentioned you didn't know about the tough cut. You know, maybe for $1,500 instead of spending an enormous amount of money in a bathroom renovation, you take off the door to get through with your walker and you do a tough cut for $1,500 and you're kind of good to go. And maybe you need to swap out your vanity with a wall hung sink for a few hundred more dollars. So there are funds as we're learning to do these things, but don't think that you always have to do the biggest and the best for what you know. There are so many other new techniques and technologies that allow us to do anything from minor to major. So keep that in mind. Thank you. So I know that we went over quite a bit of ways to accommodate um, changing realities in bathrooms. But um, this questionnaire is that they, their bathroom is not wheelchair accessible and they've been told the modification is not possible. Um, one, are there any ways to specifically find affordable accessible apartments, bathroom accessible apartments? Or two, anybody have how you get in and out of a bathroom when your wheelchair won't fit options. Well, I'll just say one thing. <laughs> it depends if the person has any mobility and whether they can stand at all. There are special poles, almost like a subway pole, that we have put inside tenants' bathrooms. And if they can hold any weight, but they just need to hold on to something every step, we've been able to get people in and out of the bathroom, in and out of the bathtub, on and off the toilet, due to putting hand holes within easy reach. But they have to have the ability to do a limited amount of standing. But again, there are many ways to do things, and we have helped people stay at home who were wheelchair users, but had some very limited mobility. All right, thank you. Um, carpet safety, did anybody bring up the good or bad of rugs and carpets when you have mobility um, problems and whether you're better off with or without them? Well, I'll jump in for that. A lot depends on um, your building issue. Some people have to have like 80% of their floors covered because of noise issues. Sometimes we've been able to get around that. Wall-to-wall um, -wall carpeting can be good if it's very dense with like very little padding underneath. You don't want plush carpeting. Um, I don't like area carpets myself, particularly small ones, because it just takes one time to get your toe underneath there to have a fall. I've dealt with many clients who've had falls from area carpets. Um, some people can do fine with big carpets, or I say, you know, that's a beautiful area carpet. Put it under the coffee table. You know, just don't have it in your walkway. I really like clear walkways. So there's no real evidence that wall-to-wall -wall carpeting is better than wood flooring per se, but you just want to make sure you have those clear pathways. Some people like having wall-to-wall -wall carpeting in the bedrooms because it's quieter, but you also want to make sure you can easily roll on it, even if you're not using a walker or a wheelchair now, which means, you know, a, a dense um, carpet. I guess, Rosemary, I'm going to stick with you because the next question relates to best living room furniture for an older person. And I know, I think in your slides, one of your slides, um, it yeah. showed a specific kind of chair that has proved to be quite valuable or also just putting more cushions on a chair. Um, so I'm curious, they also sell, but it's pretty expensive, these electronic chairs that sort of lift you and help lift you out. Is that useful or is that a waste of money? Do you know what I'm talking about? Yeah, so you know, there are electric lift chairs and I've worked with enough physical therapists to say last resort only because you need to engage and activate your muscles on a regular basis 
getting up and down. And if you don't, then you're going to get deconditioned later in life. So only as a last resort. And if you're looking for a chair, the best thing is like, don't buy it online. You really need to sit in it because everyone's built differently. But you just want to make sure that it's not too deep and too low. It's going to be harder to get out of if you have bad knees and hips. And you really want good side arms. So when you get up, usually you push off. And you need those side arms to push off, even with the dining table, if possible. So go to your local department stores, look for a chair. But you also don't want to sink into the cushion. So you're going to want a little bit more of a firmer cushion. Um, so those are the design features. I have seen the difference of one inch help somebody get up or not. So these details really matter. So go to your local store and find a chair you can get out of. Great. Thank you for that. Um, so this is jumping from your apartment to the whole building. Um, you may, they're finding it difficult to exit and enter their building because there are two steps leading to the elevator. I've also seen the question of steps leading from the sidewalk outside into the building. Does the building have an obligation to accommodate you with some kind of, I guess, um, movable um, sloping option? so that you don't need to use stairs. So I can answer that one. Um, for um, buildings that have steps in front of um, their entrances and steps in the lobby, um, if, the, if, the, if the accommodation such as a ramp or a chairlift is feasible, then the landlord should be putting that in and should be taking that cost. Um, again, um, something that Project Equal Access does, we do go out to buildings um, and we actually um, take measurements to see um, if ramps are, are feasible, if a lift is feasible. Um, we try to look at all different options um, to figure out um, the best way to get an accommodation in. Um, sometimes, unfortunately, um, a, a lift or a ramp is not feasible. And if that's the case, um, we then ask the tenant um, if they are willing to transfer um, an apartment, transfer apartment to um, another building that the landlord owns in a comparable apartment in an accessible um, building on a lower floor. I know that was mentioned earlier. All right. So you all are obviously amazing resources for learning what can and cannot be done. And so there's a whole bunch of questions that basically narrow down to now, does anybody know how to recommend particularly good, trustworthy contractors to make our homes age friendly if we need to hire someone to do the kinds of work we need. Do any of your organizations actually refer people to specific contractors or know anyone who does? I've referred a few of our clients to um, Home Depot. They have a department called Pro Referral and all of the contractors are vetted. And um, so far I've had great results. So. Great, thank you. I did not know about that. Um, okay, then there's just one question from a co-op, but I guess in a co-op situation, you're technically, unless you're a renter in the co-op, in which case I think it's all the same answers as if you're a renter somewhere else. But if you're the owner in a co-op situation, I believe the answer is you probably need to get approval for doing any significant um, construction changes to your own apartment, but the building itself probably doesn't have a legal obligation to do that for you. Is that correct? Anyone know? OK, 
okay, I'm not getting an answer there, but I, but I think with what I know about co-op law, anything inside your apartment is your responsibility as an owner. Um, and if you're a renter in a co-op, then you're dealing with the people, whoever owns the actual underlying co-op, not per se the building management, because the building management is not your landlord. It's whoever you're renting the co-op from. That co-op owner is obligated to deal with things for you. Okay, additional building-wide issues. Um, all right, the front metal the front metal front door is difficult to open and to be kept open long enough to enter or leave the building. It is made of such heavy ironwork that is challenging for even young residents. It was installed 20 years ago. Is there an obligation for a landlord to deal with a exceptionally heavy front door as an accommodation? Um, I can answer that. So again, with Project Equal Access, um, one of the things that we would do is we would go out and do an assessment, a site survey, and do a measurement on the door pressure. Um, for external doors, um, there is a uh, an ADA guideline that we follow um, in terms of the pounds of pressure. Um, so it's uh, eight between eight and ten pounds is the pressure. We use a we actually use a special tool um, to measure that. Um, and if it's above that, then we will um, we will negotiate and work with the landlord to make sure that um, either the uh, the door pressure gauge is um, is let out a little bit, um, or if um, if possible, um, automatic door openers are installed. Thank you. A question from a little earlier that I jumped over: Are there any health insurance programs, either Medicare, uh, Medicaid, or private insurance that actually pays for um, accommodations for your home? Because I think what we're also talking about is ensuring that people are able to stay in their homes for a longer period of time and live independently. So do we know, are there any health insurance possibilities for paying for things? Uh, I don't know. Okay. I also don't know. It's an excellent question. We may have to find more experts in health insurance to help us walk through whether there's any possibilities. I do know that say most insurance has what they call durable equ medical equipment that they have to pay for. And yes, you need prescription from your doctors. And the ones that are like obvious to me are you need a wheelchair. And so your doctor writes you a prescription for a wheelchair and then your health insurance needs to pay for that. I believe there are a number of other kinds of pieces of equipment, um, including, I believe, the kind of what I would call hospital beds, where it's a kind of bed that adjusts in, vari in a variety of ways that may also um, make it easier for you to remain in your own home, and including beds that go up and down and have safety bars, et cetera. I know that certain kinds of insurance do cover them, usually for monthly rentals, not actually buying them outright, but those also require a medical uh, prescription. So if you're thinking about pieces of equipment that will make life more accessible to you, both in your apartment and getting in and out of your apartment, I would certainly suggest you look into what coverage your health insurance um, has, but they usually, it falls under the category that I believe they call durable medical equipment. And so it's not necessarily changing the structure of your apartment, but it may be providing you equipment in your apartment that makes it more um, accessible for you to be able to stay living there and obviously wheelchair type of equipment allows you to come and go. Um, and it is actually 1125. So 
we did not get to all the many other questions that people had been submitting. Um, so I apologize, but my office will review them. And if there's anything we think we do know the answers to, we will try to follow up. And of course, there's all kinds of resources that we put in chat and we will be forwarding to you as long as you've given us your email to make sure that we send you um, not only the PowerPoints today, the, present, the presentations today, um, and all the resources that our guests spoke of or put in chat during the course of this hour and a half. I want to thank Rosemary, Josh, Anna, Craig, Mandulika. I want to thank my staff, Wendy Brennan, Justin Flagg, Ian Stewart, for making sure that this all actually gets online and happens the way it's supposed to. I want to remind everyone that our final roundtable in this series is scheduled for Thursday, May 11th from 10 to 1130, and we'll be focusing on the need to create more housing for older people and how to advocate for housing to meet their needs. I want to thank everyone for joining us this morning. Um, and it's actually pretty nice out today, so maybe everybody get out and see if they can take a little bit of a walk since we have one of our rare, sunny, clear days. Take care. Bye.